welcome to Room for Discussion. Today we have the honor of being joined by the CEO of a fintech company very close to us here in Amsterdam and to university students. Since its launch, the Guido has become the largest online brokerage platform on the continent, bringing innovative accessibility and competitive prices. And our guest today has been at the helm of uh, the Giro since its acquisition by Flatex, spearheading this innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mohamed Gharour. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Sharu, or Thanks, sir, you're very busy. Uh, the Giro has been able to become the brokerage platform for us here at the University of Amsterdam. Maybe we want to ask the audience before we start, who in here has a De Giro account? Who in here did not have a De Giro account four years ago? Okay. So you see that uh, many of us got to know the Giro recently. How did your job evolve in the past years? Oh, how did my job evolve in the past years? I mean, the whole company has, has evolved and uh, pretty well over the past years. Um, how so? When, sorry? How so? Um, especially um, during the last, I would say, five years, we have had, obviously, uh, in the European market, a digitization shift. I always say online brokerage, since we're here in academia, is like the second derivative of digitization, right? You never have met a person that doesn't have uh, an online banking account if that person is not digitized. Uh, you cannot have an online banking account without internet access. And you most probably never met a person that has an online brokerage account without having an online banking account. So online brokerage is, is mentally somehow the last pot that you have uh, in, your, in your mind, right? You receive your income, your salary, or whatever other income, passive incomes, and then you, you spend your consumption, and the rest of it is then saved, and some part of the savings are then invested. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a process that um, I consider to be a secular trend that started especially the last five years, irrespective of the fact that online brokerage exists now for almost 25 years, right? Um, so an increasing level of digitization leads to an increasing level of online banked people, and uh, eventually leads to an increasing level of online broker people. And uh, with that ev evolution of, of digitization, the job has uh, also actually uh, got more and more velocity. Because w would you say that when you compare to old brokers, uh, you were able to jump on the digitization uh, wave and, and maybe become market leader because of that? Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because uh, we were a relatively late-born broker. Um, online brokerage started literally in the end of 90s, mm. when you used to have your 56k modem that did these fancy sounds when you tried to connect to the internet. I don't know who remembers that. Not that uh, many. So you were, <laughs> you, were, you, were, you were shouting to your mama or daddy, yeah. hey, hang up the phone, I need the internet connection. <laughs> so uh, this was a time when, when, when literally banking was brought the first time, did digital, so to speak, into the internet. And um, with, with an evolution of that, um, we, what we see today is, however, that, that the way of online brokerage literally didn't change. Mm. So you still go online, you still buy your whatever, KLM or your ING shares, like you did 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, and what we try to say is, the only thing that we need to change is, given much higher efficiencies, uh, that we find it absolutely not explainable why someone should pay a percent or two percent of his order size as fees. Now, the only reason why you do that is because of inefficiencies of the service provider. And this is something that we have managed to do pretty well, to come in later than everyone else, but start with a much more efficient platform that allows today trading for very low fees. The Giro has allowed us all to buy stocks more efficiently, as you just said, but perhaps a playful question, what was the first stock you bought yourself? The first stock I bought myself was in 2007, mm -hmm. um, the Porsche stock. It was this ongoing fight, uh. who takes over who? Volkswagen takes over Porsche, or Porsche takes over Volkswagen? And, uh, and, and I was, you, your bet was that Porsche, Porsche will take over Volkswagen. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was a big fan of, of Wendelin Wiedeking, who, who actually revitalized Porsche. So Porsche was more or less almost insolvent, mm. uh, very bad shape. And he came in 
and he literally turned the company, the brand, upside down. Yeah. And if there wasn't the financial crisis, <laughs> they would have ended up Porsche owning Volkswagen. By the way, which is literally the case today. So the Porsche yeah, family yeah. has the higher stake, but the brand is owned by Volkswagen. Do you still have it? Uh, no, I don't have Porsche. How, how, how was your return? Uh, it was not that good because when the financial crisis kicked in, the Porsche uh, shares slumped down. Yeah. So but it was a good experience. First steps, but a uh, lot to learn. Painful learning curve, yeah, I would yeah, call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so currently you are the CEO of the Giro and the CFO of Platex. Um, you have two jobs at once, uh, you could say. Um, what does your d daily schedule uh, look like? Uh, oh gosh. My daily, my daily schedule, I think there is no daily schedule. Um, I live more or less operationally from week to week, to be honest. Mm. Um, having these two roles, on the one hand side, operationally taking care of the international expansion um, of, with, with the hero, with this beautiful brand and with the people here in Amsterdam and uh, in the Rembrandt Tower, uh, the 250 people that uh, I have to manage with my colleagues on the one hand side. And on the other hand side, the group CFO role, uh, although I have to admit uh, I have great uh, finance people, so I'm not really involved in two day-to-day -day finances, but I'm, uh, I'm responsible for the uh, investor relations and being a listed yeah. company, an SDAX company. Yeah, you, I, I heard you spend one third of your time doing investor relations, is that true? I would say minimum one third. And so. is that calling people and saying the hero is great, you should invest? <laughs> How does that work? Yeah, it, it would be that would be the or that would be the nicer part. Yeah. Uh, given uh, the market environment over the last, I would say, three months, it's rather the other way around. How Please don't leave. Uh, exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, to explain to the world and to, to to institutional investors, to a lot of institutional investors, the operational performance, the operational excellence, um, and to take away fears and doubts. And uh, to try to, um, to to highlight what is what is the microeconomic factor and, and yeah. success, and what is macroeconomically driven. Um, but yeah, I, actually, I'm, I'm until today, uh, today and tomorrow here, and then I'm flying out to London for a two-day roadshow. So you go, you see your shareholders, you meet them, and most of them are significant shareholders, three, four, five percent and up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you have to be visible, you have to be there, you have to explain. They get FaceTime with you. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're a listed company, so you have quarterly reports. So every quarter you sit there and you discuss with, with analysts and with investors uh, yeah. what's going right and what's going wrong. Um, on the other side, it's very helpful to have these both ends of the job because very often investor relations is a lot of transporting information that you receive secondhand from yeah. your CEO, from your CFO, from your COO. Uh, and for me, it's much easier because I'm, I'm just explaining my day-to-day -day job uh, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. To, to the investors. Yeah. You pull out your agenda, you say, look. Exactly. <laughs> it's my calendar, this yeah. is what it is. So, so this is what you do on a daily basis, you work very hard. Uh, I, I think you told us, yeah, I have a meeting at 6 and we were like, yes. well, we will be having dinner by then. <laughs> uh, uh, people <laughs> are then, uh, uh, you are still working, so, so respect for that. But, uh, um, what makes you work so hard? So when you stay up in the, when you get up in the morning, you think, okay, I'm going to work very hard today to eventually achieve this or this. Well, what is the end goal of all this work? Gosh, what is, I mean, I'm not a person that wakes up and thinks, oh, I have to work very hard today. Um, it's, I think, also an outside-in perspective and an inside-out perspective. I'm now eight years with the company, uh, when I took over that role. We were like a 100 million Tom, Dick and Harry shop from southern Germany that was doing a bit of brokerage. Mm. Um, eight years later, we are the, the European market leader with almost two and a half million clients, uh, settling tons of millions of transactions um, and with a clear philosophy and vision, which is to retailize capital market access. Mm. And um, being myself coming from a background where trading was I, I never discussed with my parents trading. They had no clue about trading. Mm. You know? I mean, they have no clue about financial services in general. Uh, lower working class. Um, it's it's been it became more and more an inner desire, right, to say, hey, look, why is that? You know, why is financial literacy so low? Uh, for the Dutch population, it's maybe less understandable, um, because it's it has it carries a relatively high financial literacy. Well, if you go to Germany, I always call them the underdeveloped G7, which is Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Italy, France, Spain, and Portugal. Underdeveloped. I call them underdeveloped G7. Um, why? Because uh, we were just discussing it, right? 45% of this continental population does not have 
an online banking account. I mean, imagine every second person in continental Europe walks into a branch to get printouts and uh, to do money deposits or to do the payment instructions. And uh, it's pretty difficult to realize until uh, you realize that your parents literally walk two times a week to the bank mm -hmm. branch. Yeah. So uh, why is that? Because we still live in an environment where, where banking is very, very tight, connected to trust. Uh, people uh, like in the old days are bringing their money to the bank to be put into a, into a safe. This is their imagination. And now there are players like us coming, coming more and more to the market. I and mean, we're not a startup, but uh, nevertheless, for 15 years in the market, bringing this new idea of, hey, trust not the branch, trust yeah. this little thing here, right? Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. your branch. Yeah. Which is, for I would say 99% of the campus, self evident, mm -hmm. right? Because this is our. our our life, more or less, um, but but not for people that are in their 40s, you know, plus, yeah. because this is a generation that grew up without this yeah. thing, uh, including myself, um, but having difficulties to trust these things. Yeah. So this is literally what drives us. Not only yeah. me, what drives the whole team to say everybody has everybody has an access uh, yeah. to to capital markets because in the end, what you do is when you bring money to your bank and deposit it. It's nothing else than to trust your money and to believe in the bank. Mm -hmm. So you could also buy just like the share of the bank. You know, it's, it's exactly the same outcome because if the bank goes bankrupt, so you, lo you will lose both ends. And if it goes right, you will enjoy both ends. Okay, moving perhaps back to the gear, uh, you touched upon on your one of your responses the uncertain times of the last couple of months. Uh, but it seems that despite the uncertainty of volatility, the gear uh, seems to be doing fairly well. How do you navigate these volatile times? Um, this is a very good question because I, I always reduce our whole story to what we call the formula of success. Our business model is based on literally three things. The first one is the number of clients. The second thing is the trading activity of clients. And the third thing is uh, the, the revenue per trade. So how do we monetize the business model, right? Now, the first thing, the number of clients is something that we can steer by having the right marketing, the right amount of marketing, uh, yeah. the right penetration of marketing. This is something that lies in our hands, uh, both ends budget-wise and commercially-wise with the marketing team. The second variable is, is a very much endogenous variable, which is trading activity. This is something that we cannot we cannot drive. I mean, yes, we can help it to go into the right direction by sending you the most traded stocks or mm. some, some ideas, some nudges. But um, the trading activity depends very much on volatility. Yeah, which you can't control. Which you absolutely cannot control, yeah, no. right? So you, you're, you're lost to this variable. That's, no. This variable mm. is, is a variable that is, that is given by markets. Um, so, uh, the biggest difficulty is to, to become clear about this fact, you know? Despite, despite watching every day your KPI dashboards and being annoyed about trading activity, to say, hey, look, mm. there's something I cannot control. But what can I control is the number of clients and the revenue per trade, right? Yeah. The monetization and of the business. Despite current marketing uh, circumstances, your, your uh, numbers are impressive, right? For the, yeah, for the first quarter of 2022, they were really impressive so yeah that's uh, yeah because you you gained 185,000 customers you had a 76 percent growth in your EBITDA uh, and uh, so we were thinking um, are you maybe profiting off volatility is it actually helping you grow absolutely volatility is is one of the most supporting item to to a brokerage business model right as much as interest um, interest curves support classic banking businesses. Volatility mm. supports brokerage businesses. Because mm. the more volatile markets get, and yeah. especially keeping in mind what type of clients we have, you know, our client type is a very trading active person in average. The more volatility uh, the market uh, is, is, is having, yeah. uh, the bigger the chances for these people to, to trade in and out, yeah. and thus, w thus their, their um, trading activity will increase. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, we always said volatility is the hidden reserve in our business model. But what we see now is a certain kind of normalization. 
right? So you had, when you look into trading activities... The, the green markets, you call them uh, normalized? Uh, for, for us, it's normalized because, okay. I mean, that's a good oh, point. That, that would have been a great quote. Uh, <laughs> the European markets are normalized. Right? Yeah, the markets are literally normalizing with respect to our client base. So what you see is, okay, yeah, so in yeah. 2016, 17, 18, 19, which I consider average mm. good years, yeah. our clients were doing between 40 and 50 transactions per year. Yeah. And rather, rather 40 to 45, even, the lower 40s. Now, 2020, the COVID year, and 2021, this new stock hype year, pushed up the trading activity, right? Because people were much more involved, right? They got more time, they had more ideas, things were going around in markets, so they were more, more uh, incentivized to go into trading. And now, all this has come down. Hmm. So what you see now is the hard core of clients that used to trade in the past and still trading. So the trading activity is still in the high 30s, low 40s. Uh, so this is why I call it normalization yeah, yeah, yeah. for us. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, your CEO, I think the, the only boss you have uh, uh, in, in the whole in the, the, the CEO the of Platics, um, he commented on your quarterly uh, results, and he said, "Our strategy is to combine industry-leading growth with high profitability." Could you um, explain to me how is that a strategy and not a goal? How is that a strategy, not a goal? Um, I'll tell you why. Unfortunately, especially the e-commerce world, has transformed from a perspective of profitability into a pure perspective of growth. Mm -hmm. So when we consider all mm -hmm. the types of, of new startups, whether tech or non-tech, you know, I mean, by the way, everyone is calling himself a tech just because he employs three tech interns yeah. <laughs> that, are, that, are, that are maintaining the website. So the, the point is that a lot of business models over the last five, six, seven, eight years mm -hmm. were valued based on their growth, top line growth. Yeah. So no one was interested in profitability. Yeah, the, the, like Tesla, the, the, for years they did not make any uh, we could bring any real like revenue. Hundreds of companies. Yes, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the start of model the, the, the yeah. most the most recent one is I would say Robin Hood in the US, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was so much liquidity in the market, people were just looking for chances to put their money on. And uh, given especially the last ten years and and the, the, the big uh, QEs that we had in the market by central banks, put a lot of money into the market that people had to invest. Now, this from day one was our pure strategy, Mai's and and Frank's strategy, to say, hey, look. We will never ever ask our shareholders for a single penny to be spent. Mm. It's like you know when when you're when you're old enough, you don't go to mom and dad anymore to ask for ten euros to buy yourself a beer. Mm. You go find yourself a job to get a beer, right? And this is has been a strategy for us over the last eight years. Mm. And over the last eight years, we did not a single capital round that oh, was yeah. due to funding for expenses. Yep. We did two capital rounds, which were both strategically, once with the Austrian Post, the other one was with Morgan Stanley, to bring them in strategically as shareholders. Mm -hmm. But we always wanted to generate money ourselves to be profitable, to yeah. spend the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. don't spend what you don't have, you know? Mm -hmm. Very uh, German thing. Very, very <laughs> German thing, indeed. Yeah. Uh, don't spend something that you don't have. It, it, is, it is one of the cultural uh, DNAs. So this is why it's not just the goal, yeah. it's... It has always been so, the underlying strategy. So if your CEO is saying this, basically he says to investors in London, for example, look, we are growing, but we are also making money. Abs absolutely. Okay. This, is, this, is, this is exactly what distinguishes us from the rest of the pack that is mm. also growing, but spending other people's money yeah, yeah, to yeah. grow. And we are spending our, our, our own money. You mentioned uh, Robin Hood, and uh, we cannot help but make some sort of comparison between Digio and Robinhood. Do you say that's fair? Mm. Okay, maybe in terms of accessibility? If, if not, how, how is I don't, it? I don't, want to be, I don't want to be compared to a three, or, I mean, they are not three, they're eight years old, but I don't want to be compared to, to a business model um, like, like Robinhood that generates, by the way, 90% of their revenues from trading in cryptos, options, and futures. Mm. Um, why not? Because, look, we started with a clear, again, philosophy and vision to say we want to see the market fully, uh, the capital market fully retailized. 
And I like in the beginning their story of the democratization, although I hate this word because it doesn't... It's, it's on your website, democratization. Yeah, I know. You use and it as well. We, we but, use it, but, but I hate it. I hate the word because democracy, you know, uh, being myself, uh, having, having origins from countries where democracy is so far away, we should not use that word for business. So okay, say it's called retailization, call it whatever, uh, increasing the financial literacy thousand different words than to use democracy for it you know I mean we're currently having a war where it's about democracy so uh, it's a bit uh, super Western to make use of these hmm. inflated definitions does, but does this influence your 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 whole approach to business more like the, the fact that you think I'm operating in a democratic country I can absolutely uh, of course you know I mean we were taking decisions and businesses that, that uh, other people cannot take, you know? Yeah. Um, do, do you maybe appreciate it even more because of your fully, heritage? Fully, fully, absolutely. I mean, uh, I don't know how much time we have, but, but most probably not to go too much into politics, but uh, the political environment in the world is, it's, it's a wide society problems that we are taking care of, right? <laughs> Sitting here at University Amsterdam campus and discussing about brokerage, how to put your wealth into stocks. You yeah, know? I mean, yeah. other people are, are still in, in um, Maslow's first level of pyramid, which is yeah. sleep, food, and drink. You know? yeah. Yeah. So this is why I hate this word democratization yeah, to be okay. used yeah. for the top notch Maslow peak of how do I spend my super, super, super access cash in two shares. Um, but the point with, with Robin Hood is that I say it's, it's, it's not comparable to us. You know, we are, our client average age is 36, 37 years. With Robin Hood, it's a 25. You know, our clients have with us 30, 40,000 euros in average. With them, it's like $2,000, right? Oh, okay. So it's, it's a much smaller, much different scale. However, I always summarize it as Robin Hood is very much like, like also books here in the Netherlands. It's very often your first kiss broker. <laughs> we are we, we're rather like the broker that comes at a later stage in life, right? Which is more your husband slash wife broker. Okay, okay. That's, that, that, sounds, uh, that sounds fair. We, we went over your uh, Q1, uh, some of the statistics at least, and they indicate very, very good uh, results. Uh, why did the Vladek the Euro stock decline around 50% in the last 12 months? Um, I think there, there are multiple reasons to that. The first one is uh, we, we saw a massive industry rotation. That didn't start over the last weeks, it started actually in Jan, Feb, March, in the first quarter, um, that a lot of institutional investors and retail investors went out of all tech-driven businesses and went more and more to, towards commodities and utilities. Okay. So you saw people going back into electricity companies, insurances, uh, transportation and logistics uh, and all these industries that were like punished down the last two years right mm -hmm. it's very very often you see these sector rotations that might happen from half year to half to a year on year excuse me um, that's one reason and given the fact that we are a full tech company by the way 50 percent of our employees are tech people which is very abnormal for the banking industry, where mm. the benchmark is usually 15 to 20 percent. Um, you, you get into, into a kind of wave where you, you cannot swim out. That's point no. number one. No. Point number two is, unfortunately, and that, that is the question that you also brought up, you, you, you know, a lot of people, and especially the um, more, um, let me call them, ignorant people, but ignorant in a negative, but ignorant like not knowing, mm -hmm. Um, are very often or tend very often to say, okay, it's an online broker. Ah, okay, this is the same thing like Robin Hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, the yeah. same thing like CMC Markets or yeah. Plus 500. Mm. You know, so you automatically are pushed into an industry sector yep. because everyone considers brokerage as as one pot. Yeah. yeah. Although you have totally different players in this big pot. Yeah. That gives you a lot of pressure on your share price as well. Are you? Um, maybe uh, aware of even a bit scared of the fact that because your um, stock is declining, you are very profitable. This is every pri private equity manager's dream, uh, basically to take private. Do you have uh, private equity like BlackRock, KKR on your call sheet right now? That's a very sophisticated question. Um, and with these questions, we always have to take care how we answer because we are a publicly listed company. So um, 
it is absolutely everyone's dream, right, in the private equity world. Uh, yeah. a very deflated company valuation. Yep. Because public market does not understand the difference <laughs> uh, on the one hand side. On the other hand side, high revenues, high growth, high profitability. Um, does it put us onto the radar of private equities? I have to say, I don't know. But if I would sit on the other table, if, if, I, if I was sitting on the other table, I definitely would, would have Fletix de Giro on the radar. <laughs> okay. um, ah. So, yes. But do we have them on our cap table? No, we don't have private equities on our cap table because it's a publicly listed company. Mm -hmm. um, but I would be surprised if we would not generate interest in general, yeah. given the facts, just purely the facts. If they want a meeting, you take it? I mean, I mean I'm happy to meet every industry expert in this world. I mean, I'm sitting also here with you, Thanks. irrespective of the fact that you most probably don't want to buy us. So, no, yeah. <laughs> uh, no I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, we're, we're open. Look, in the end, go private transactions. So when mm. private equities take over public companies, is not a decision that, that depends on what I think or what I don't think, irrespective of the fact, of the fact that I'm not only a manager, but also owner of this company. In the end, it must be a holistic perspective. What is the best for our shareholders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the end, we have, a, we have a fiduciary responsibility as management, and that is paired with our own ownership. But if someone would come around and would say, hey, we love your company, would like to buy it, uh, I have to say, okay, uh, what, what's the offer? <laughs> yeah. So I can pass it to my shareholders and let yeah. the shareholders uh, decide. Ah, okay. yeah. But we have a clear understanding of what certain levels should be. Okay. Well, uh, maybe let's take a look at the audience. Is there anybody who has a question? This is your chance uh, to ask it. Um, no? Yeah, I don't see any. Uh, you were very, being very uh, clear up until now, so <laughs> there are no, no questions, I think. Uh, there, there is, is one. <laughs> oh, there is, sorry. Yes, um, a very high ranking one, my, my <laughs> one might say. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, again, thanks for being here with us. This is on this beautiful campus. Um, so where do you see in the longer run your model going to? And uh, I mean, what scope is there for, um, you know, FinTech uh, you know, to, to improve industry and to, to make savings? Because eventually it's mostly about transactions rather than, you know, the capital sums, so to say. Um, that is... It is a question that could fill a long evening with some good bottles of wine. Mm -hmm. uh, because I still believe that the financial technology, of, let me put it the other way around, the technolization of financial services is still in, in, in Charles Chu's. You know? We're at the very, very beginning of, of this development. As I said, 45% of continental Europe's population don't have a banking account, an online banking account. Um, so going forward, where are we heading to? We are heading to the potential of roughly 250 million people in continental Europe that don't have a brokerage account. I hope you agree all with me, quarter a billion of people, this is something we can call a big potential. Given the fact that only 25 million have a brokerage account. Um, and this is also what we consider as a big goal on the long run. How can we I'm repeating myself, retalize the capital market access and give everyone the opportunity to be part of this bigger thing. And um, by the way, it also shows the big potential for capital markets itself. If you would bring quarter a billion of people into this market, um, that will also drive valuation to a certain point. Um, but the biggest challenge is still the technolization of financial services. And unfortunately, Usually, it's not the big companies, the big incumbents that drive this, this technology steps. Uh, we see it in, in, in Germany, we see it in, in, in Spain, in France, in Italy. As I said, banking is still made like 20, 30 years ago. Um, it's, it's, it's not a surprise that companies like Commerce Bank and Deutsche Bank, by the way, number one and number two in Germany, uh, are, are state-owned, you know? Um, with, with like return equity targets that are around 4%. Let me just remind you, the inflation is currently at 8. Mm. So it's like a, a confession of, of, of poorness, you know, to say, hey, my return equity that I would like to give you as my shareholders is half of the inflation. 
Um, but th that shows you that they, they, they missed the inflection point. This is what we see. But what, on the other hand side, there is not, not enough, enough push, not enough uh, drive to see more and more new players coming to this market because it's a massively regulated environment. So with a lot of entry barriers. That's the only thing, by the way, why we still have a Deutsche Bank and the Commerce Bank. And, and the same applies, by the way, to many, many other banks. Societe Generale, uh, Banca Intensa, Fineco, and so on and so forth. Um, but on the long run, you will see an increasing level of digitization. This is for sure. You will see an increasing level of people that are fully digitized. In 30 years, I doubt to see one person that doesn't own something like a mobile phone. I don't know what we will have then. And thus, um, uh, the, the push, the pressure on these old incumbents to start now to digitize their business models uh, will increase year on year, which puts us in a, in, a perfect, in a perfect momentum because we are already fully digitized, we are set, we are already in a market-leading position, we have Maybe the firepower. Maybe if I can um, uh, get you on the um, uh, digitization track, um, we read a lot about you preparing for this interview and about the Giro, of course. And uh, I would like to talk about your IT um, because for you that's the bed and butter. Uh, if, if it doesn't work, you have a lot of angry customers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to read a quote to you. You may not like it because it's from a, a former IT manager uh, who was quoted in the Financial Times mm -hmm. of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And he said, you should look at the IT system of the Giro uh, like this. And it was, I think, um, one and a half year ago he said this. Um, he said, uh, basically, they at this moment are a house. And they are built on the foundation of a house. They would like to become a flat, much bigger, more customers. Um, but uh, if you call it a flat and start building a flat, but don't uh, change the foundation, you are building on what you could call a shitty foundation for a flat. Do you agree? Yeah. Are you, what are you doing to change that? Uh, no, I, I, I agree to, to his theory. I didn't agree that we have a shitty foundation. Okay, is it exactly. Uh, I find, look, I find it always interesting if former colleagues yeah. said something about a technology stack one and a half years ago when they were in charge. It's, it's like the most absurd things that I always hear. Yeah, right? so I, I, I would like to know, what, what, did, did you since then, because one half year there were some big legs, people couldn't actually Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. What, what, what changed? Can, can you prove it wrong? What? Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is, this is our duty to prove it wrong, you know, to prove it wrong over the time. And uh, look, there is no perfect world. You will mm. never ever have 100% uptime. Even Amazon doesn't manage to be 100% uptime, right? Yeah. It doesn't exist. Uh, because this is, we are all human beings and technology is developed by human beings and human beings tend to make errors and errors will result into not 100% uptime. Um, but the, the hero for us when we acquired the hero, when we, when we took the decision to acquire the hero, we were very much aware of the downsides, of the disadvantages, of the challenges, yeah. of the issues even. Yeah. I don't make it make it make it a security because it's all public knowledge. Also, the discussions with the regulators and so on and mm. so forth, which will be they, they were all given. Yeah. We all knew about this. Yeah. Uh, we were very very aware of the fact um, that, that it's not the perfect world. You know. No 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 no. no. Um, but we knew that we can tackle most of actually all of these points. Mm. Some of the points we were able to tackle very quickly, like in months. Yeah. Some others in quarters. Yeah. So and others, right now, right now, where are you at this point? At this point, I would say, except for the IT topic, we have covered 95% of all the synergies. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to IT, and that is the point, it takes a bit longer, you yeah. know, because it's IT. Yeah. I mean, and you, you have to you have to rethink the whole target operating model of yeah. the IT. You have to find out, okay, what difficulties do we have with the existing the IT model, and then uh, and then step by step, modular yeah. by module to change it. So this so is a process that takes, yeah, maybe one, two years to go. Yeah. So the, the underlying information that the foundation was not robust to build a high tower, yeah. but yeah. only five levels, yeah. is absolutely right. But yeah. the point I always say is, and in all credits to the former owners, they never thought of building a tower. No, 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 no. So no, when we right, came yeah. in as, as, as Flatex and we merged the two entities, we said, okay, we don't want to have two buildings of five 
levels. Yeah. We want to build a tower not of 10 levels, but of 20 levels. Yeah. Which yeah. means you have to rethink, to re-engineer the fundaments, which, which is being done yeah. and takes time. So we should have stayed and seen for himself what you, <laughs> you were doing. Uh, I mean, I could, I, could, I could be now sneaky and say, if that person stayed with us, he or she could have contributed to that success. Yes. But uh, yes. sometimes it's easier, you know, like a football coach, to yeah. leave, the, the, to leave the, the club and then say, yeah. what yeah, went it's wrong? Easy, you know? yeah, it's easy when you're sitting on the set. Uh, are, yeah. there, are, there so, are there such uh, scale of issues, perhaps, if you can call it that? And uh, how is such rapid growth sustainable when such issues pop up? Um, is it scalable? The platform is highly scalable. Um, it was designed from the beginning, and by the way, we never had issues with respect uh, to the system when it comes to growth. Mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, two years ago, there was this waiting list that were introduced by the hero, but this was literally a KYC issue, mm -hmm. so they didn't come up with the KYC in clients. This is why they put in the waiting list. It was less a technological issue that we couldn't handle okay. customer growth or trade load. Um, so just to give you a very simple, we currently operate our systems on 25% utilization. Okay. So we could handle three, four times the load in terms of trades uh, that we have in average days. And we proved it. I mean, in February last year, we had on one day 900,000 trades, although we do an average 250 to 300,000 trades per day. Um, but this again comes out of a perspective, why do I feel so confident and positive? Because the whole business model is based on 500 high-tech developers. These people yeah. know what they do. We are not the fancy commercial business that is trying to do some do-it-yourself engineering on the technological platform, but exactly the other way around. Second, um, the growth is managed very well. You know, I mean, we don't go crazy and say, hey, we want to win now every year one and a half million clients because we know how much load we can put on our systems. We know what it takes. So it is sustainable. In that. So that's the point, exactly. Coming to the consequence to say, this is why the strategy is also so sustainable. i rather grow every year with 500,000 that I can manage than to go with millions of clients to find out three years later, oops, I'm at the end of my technological capabilities and mm. capacities. Yeah. Um, in preparation for this interview, we were contacted by some student investment societies mm -hmm. from both Rotterdam and Nijmegen. And they said, said they um, protested the fact that they were being kicked off the Giro last year. Are you uh, aware that, that they were kicked off? No. What, what, what do you mean by kicked off? Well, I, I, the accounts were, were yeah. suspended. Not that I'm aware of. Not that you are aware of. No. Okay, well then you can... But thanks for the input, because yeah. I will but worth follow up on that. Yeah. That, that, that would be absolutely counterintuitive yeah. yeah. uh, to take out the investments. No, absolutely not. Um, we have decided to do a couple of things. We, we off-boarded corporate accounts mm -hmm. uh, because of increasing KYC regulation that makes it super difficult to, to, to keep uh, B2B accounts. Mm -hmm. um, same applies for, for minority accounts, but apart from that, not to my knowledge, but thanks for the input. Yeah, we'll, we'll follow up on that. We will forward you the input. Yeah, happy to, yeah. happy to. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Maybe we can then turn the discussion to the, to the regulator, uh, the regulators, I, I should say. And before you moved to Germany, you touched upon this. You had some, the Giro rather, had some trouble with the IFM. Uh, in 2018, the company was fined under the Financial Supervision Act, as it translates, so I'm not entirely sure. Correct. I assume the, there was no deliberate non-disclosure of information to regulators. So how can how can that happen? How did this find happen? Uh, I mean, look, it's 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 not about non-disclosure of information. Um, okay. and very often it is it is what the Hero had uh, when when as I said when we thought the first time about acquiring the Hero, the Hero had a massive, massively successful commercial story. Hmm. Um, as I said, we are operating in the financial industry, uh, so under, s under a certain regulatory framework. It's not like an e-commerce where you don't care about left and right because you just can grow. Mm -hmm. uh, here you have to play with rules. And um, what happened is that maybe here and there, there was a lack of focus towards the framework. Or you can put it also the other way around. The company grew much better than originally expected, which hmm. led to the point that um, but here and there were some, some missing parts in technological support 
prove, for example, and this is one of the, the issues, the TRS, the reporting of transaction mm. reports, right? Mm. Um, so these things happen. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we see these, or we saw these issues from the beginning, but we managed also to tackle them, to solve them. Um, it the might have technology following the growth. It's, it's always, it, I, absolutely. With regulators, it was never uh, that much about the non-technological part. It was, it was the TRS issue that was the point, the transaction reporting services mm -hmm. um, that, that we are carrying. Uh, plus, there were one, two other things that are also public, and uh, the Telegraph loves to, uh, loves to report about every nitty-gritty, um, which are ongoing. And uh, there are points where we agree but there are also points where we disagree, and when we disagree, uh, we will make use of all legal possibilities to, to, to discuss this into or in front of the proper court mm -hmm. to make a decision whether we are right or they are right. Maybe we can uh, exactly discuss this regulatory framework that you've experienced. Would you say that there are times where, for instance, the IFM in the Netherlands might have needlessly complex laws that more so hinder innovation perhaps or growth than protect the customer base? No, no, to be honest, no. I mean, I, I had, uh, I had, uh, we had a lot of meetings with the AFM and I always had a really, and I mean it, a really positive feeling how things are tackled. I would even say that the Dutch law, irrespective of the Dutch regulation law, irrespective of the fact that it's more harsh than many other Europeans, but it's clear, you mm -hmm. know? It doesn't give you that much interpretation because it's either here or there, right? So, give a very to give a very simple example, the no, so the commission ban. You know, mm -hmm. everywhere else in Europe, every regulator is like, okay, this is the framework, but if you define it like left, right, uh, left or right, or it might fit, it might not fit, and then mm -hmm. three years later you find out whether you're fined or not. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with the regulator here in the Netherlands, it's super simple, no commission, oh, yeah. full stop. Yep. So you know how to build your business model. Um, Regulators per se are are there to give to give an industry a framework that customers are protected. Yeah, which I really appreciate. Um, what I hate most is the inconsequence, you know, which is super dangerous because what we see in Europe is a lot of regulatory arbitrage. Mm -hmm. Right, we have one European Union. But every regulator in the European Union, because it's national regulators, can do its own thing. Exactly. Yeah, they yeah. can gold plate or silver plate it or whatever, you know, yeah. iron plate it only. Yeah. So when you see them players coming from Lithuania or from Cyprus or from Malta yeah. applying their domestic regulation on Europe's market, mm. you in the end, you're there like a little kid you, or you like you have two children. And I would tell my one girl, hey, you're allowed to, to stay out until whatever. Yeah. Six in the evening, and the other one, hey, you have to be home at 4.40, you know, yep. and she's like, why, you know, well, and this is what makes it difficult for us as Germans or Dutch players yeah. to deal with this, on the one hand side, holistic European market, but then with different rules. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 I, I, I can see how that, that must be frustrating. Uh, because the, 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 you have a new regulator now, right now, because the Giro was, of course, bought out by Platex in 2019. And then uh, you moved the headquarters to uh, Germany, or the headquarters became Germany, and you registered as a Bijzaak, uh, so like an, an, an dependent store, I would say. Branch. Mm -hmm. Branch in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you now fall under the jurisdiction of the BaFin, the, the, the German re regulator? Uh, yes, that's, that's a pretty complex uh, task. So what we had is, we had on the one hand side, so before we acquired the Giro, the Kido, we were Flatex Bank, so a German full-fledged bank, mm. so CRR Institute, yeah. deposit-taking um, bank. And the hero was, in, was, was obviously licensed under the, the, the AFM and DNB licenses mm. as, a, as an investment broker. Yeah. Right? So when we acquired the hero, we were ending up like a bit in a limbo, right? Because you had on the one hand side the German regulator, on the other yeah. hand side you were fully regulated in the Netherlands, mm. yeah. which makes things quite complex, as you can imagine, because irrespective of the fact that both are relatively similar in their philosophy, but there are still differences. And what, 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 what is the biggest difference, you would say? It, it, starts, with, it starts with communication, you know? Communi Baffin is a very German, 
very German culturally like written communication world and the AFM is, is somewhere where you can spare also on a phone. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Um, irrespective and, of the and, fact and that they always tell you that they cannot advise, but nevertheless, <laughs> you can at least, at least you have a di more direct communication. Yeah. But the, the most difficult thing is, or happens and starts to happen when you harmonize back offices, right? Mm. And yeah. back office structures, as because on the, as we did, so on the one hand side, we had then to have two policies in the company that says, okay, if it's a trade done by a Dutch citizen, yeah. with the hero, mm. you have to settle it A, yeah. And if it's done by a German client, you have to settle with you. So, so uh, how did you solve this? By merging the company. So we didn't shift anything around. We just took the bank yeah. and the, the hero, yeah. uh, BV, yeah. and merged both entities. And what happened then is mm -hmm. that usually the, the biggest license survives. And that was? And that was the bank, the full-fledged banking license because it's the bigger license. So you are on the regulation of the Today Bafin. we are on the regulation of the Bafin and Bundesbank yeah. as and a core regulator. Yeah. But given that we are here still a branch, mm -hmm. we fall under the AFM uh, customer protection rules. Okay. So we are still, to a certain degree, regulated by AFM. Yeah, a certain degree, okay. Um, there were, were also people in the media uh, who wrote they are moving because of the investigations, they like the Bafin better. <laughs> Did you? Unfortunately, the Bafin uh, doesn't care about uh, who found the, the issues. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all the issues that, that uh, were found by AFM and DNB by the hero, yep. or with the hero, they were obviously reported to the Bafin. I mean, I don't, I don't understand these people claiming that stuff. I mean, but, but the AFM finds you, right? But it doesn't matter. So mm -hmm. not the IFM find us in the past, yeah. and they 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 and and, they, and they can do in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. still, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, this you is why we still have also this litigation with the AFM. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely not like you can run away from a regulator by saying, yeah. "Hey, ha ha, I go to Germany because the Bafin." Because yeah. what does the Bafin do? They will talk to their colleagues in the Netherlands and will yeah. receive all files, mm -hmm. and then will exactly go after these findings. So the AFM can still investigate you on all on all topics that happened before the transaction or during now if it's a customer protection topic. Yeah. Okay. So there is room for investigations. Sure. For the AFM, absolutely, because they are not yeah. the lead regulator anymore. Yeah. But the Bafin does now the lead regulation for both ends, Giro and Flatex. Working working in around the twenty different countries, uh, do you comply with twenty different customer protection uh, yes. regulations? Yeah. So what you do, if, you're, if you passport your services across Europe is, you have one lead regulator, which is the Bafin, Bundesbank, yeah. Germany, um, and then each and every country in which you passport your business, mm -hmm. you have to fulfill the local rules of customer protection uh, in each and every country. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I have a question though, because uh, the Bafin finds you 2.7 million, and last week in court you argued they can, yeah. because we are under jurisdiction of the... Uh, no, no. Uh, yes and no. It is not right, rightfully uh, reported. Um, we believe that the fine that we received back then um, should have not come from the AFM but from the DNB. Yeah. That is a totally different litigation and, and a totally different legal question. It's not because we are now under the bath and you cannot fine us anymore. Yeah. Uh, our, our lawyers have a different understanding of who should originally have fined us. But in the, in the newspaper it says that you also think that I'm the sorry for the newspaper. is the one to, to uh, find you, but you, that's no, not no, no, your no, opinion. It's, it's, I mean, it's, uh, again, I'm, I don't know where they got this information from. I didn't speak to the newspaper. I'll record your opinion. Uh, okay, then they should maybe properly read the record. Okay, well, if you, if you say so. The original discussion goes first whether yeah. the fine is right or not. Yeah. So was there an issue or not? We see it differently than the AFM. Yeah. Uh, that's that's, uh, that's, that's yeah. uh, d discourse in the content. Yeah. And the second thing is, who is the right entity, who is the right legal framework entity to find? Was it the AFM or should it have been the DMB? Hmm. Maybe we can uh, try to have uh, some audience questions again. Does anyone have a question that they might want to ask? Yes, right here. Something in the front. So you said earlier that the comparison between the Hero and Robin Hood was not uh, a correct comparison. Uh, which online brokerage would you say is the Robin Hood of the Dutch and German markets? Oh, that's a new question. Yeah. 
Let me put it that way. I think that we are rather a player like E-Trade in the US. Um, I don't know whether we have in the Netherlands a player like Robin Hood. Um, so this is why I think everyone has his or her right to, to develop his or her business model and uh, to be what they want to be. Uh, for us, it's important just to say that, that we are not the Robin Hood type of model. Um, and I think everyone here knows who might be in the Netherlands the first kiss broker and the, the jingles and confetti broker, um, which we are not. Sorry? That, that, that's, that, that's a lovely coincidence. I mean, that, that might happen, absolutely. I'm not saying that it never is your first kiss broker. I could say as often as it ends up that your first kiss ends to be also your wife or husband. Um, but it's, it's uh, not usually the case that we are the first kiss broker. But hopefully it's also your last kiss. <laughs> Before we, we move on to, to the rest of the questions, uh, I can help but again draw a comparison maybe with the way you operate on a pan-European level. Uh, with another company that is also pretty dear to students, and that is uh, the Revolut Bank. Would you say that there are any comparisons, or is that uh, the... No, uh, Revolut, Revolut is a pure online bank, first and foremost. Yes. It's coming out of the online banking world, and uh, tries rather to be some kind of bunk in the Netherlands, or mm. N26 in Germany, like this new type of uh, fancy online banks. and. Um, which, by the way, very often are just fancy on the outside, you know. Mm. Um, but, but it's big, I, I have to say. Sorry? It, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. No, 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 for, for sure. Um, and I think they are, they're doing a, a very good job. But it's nothing that we perceive as a competitor or as a peer. Yeah. As a peer innovator, but not, not really. Uh, yeah. As a peer innovator, perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. As a peer innovator, yes, for sure. To have the right ideas, to have the right approaches. Um, but for us, brokerage is key. Mm. And, and we're here very simple uh, with, with the idea of stick to your guns, you know. We are brokerage experts, irrespective of the fact we have a full-fledged banking license, so we were able, we would be able to offer you tomorrow also current accounts and a debit card. We want to stay with our brokerage uh, expertise. Okay, then um, we move on to the last uh, topic. Um, that's about um, the role of the, the zero stakeholders and their, their interests. Um, for example, in, in France, you have the financial regu uh, regulator who indicates that the danger of C CFDs by disclaiming at least 89% of investors lose money on CFDs. The Giro does not offer them, um, but uh, you take other precautions to protect your consumer um, base from financial risk. And um, we were wondering, do you think the tests on your platform are really protecting customers from complicated products? risk absolutely um, and uh, because 90 percent of the residual brokers in europe don't even have these tests uh, that's for example the difference between netherlands and the rest of the pack yeah um, opening up a cfd brokerage account with eToro or with someone else in europe is done in like five minutes mm. and we believe it's absolutely wrong because it, 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 look it's like it's like uh, Telling, telling someone who wants to become a pilot in his first or her first hour, uh, here you go, here are the keys, you know? It's like I would give uh, my, my daughter, if she were 18, uh, keys to a, to a 700 horsepower car, you know? I mean, it's crazy. You cannot do it. No. Um, thus, we introduced these, um, these uh, knowledge tests. Yep. Um, you need to answer, for example, 10 questions to be able to trade options. Now, some people say, oh, what the heck? Why do I have to answer 10 questions? And we say, because it's not, an option is not for the vast majority of the market. You know? It carries leverage risk, it carries margin risk. Um, I, I like the CFD regulation. By the way, it applies in all over Europe that you have to disclose how many uh, of your clients are losing money. And 70, 80% is an average rate. I mean, imagine 70% of the people are losing money. With us in the last three years, in each of the three years, uh, more than 60% of the clients had to pay taxes, capital gain taxes, which means they did profits. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Our assets under custody have been grown over the last three years by 150%. So people are increasing their wealth and not decreasing it, deflating it with risky products. 
So we made, we, we offer these options, obviously, because in the end you have to have this financial supermarket idea. Mm. But I always say it's like with tobacco, everyone is able to enter a supermarket, but not everyone is allowed to buy tobacco or alcohol. So you have to, to pass, not test, but at least you have to verify yourself that you're older than 18 uh, to, to buy these things. So. But, uh... So would you say that these tests help you strike the balance between protecting your customer base, perhaps, and uh, the profit motive that the company may have? No, and I tell you why, because these products are usually absolutely not profitable, to be honest with you. I mean, okay. for you, for as us, a as a broker, okay. yeah. Why? Op I mean, with options, we do the lowest revenue per trade of all products, okay. uh, right? So you have no problem in both interests, then? No, 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 absolutely not. Because look, in the end, the option, let's take options very, as an example, very easily. Mm -hmm. The point is that if you want to get the big clients with their big portfolios that trade shares, they hate to trade shares at A and options at B. So this is why in the end, you have to offer them this type of supermarket idea to say, hey, you can trade also options with us. Mm -hmm. But on option trade, I mean, we do an average, I think 60 cents per trade, while our average revenue per trade is five euros plus. So that, that gives you the impression also of why we are absolutely not, or why we are agnostic whether people trade options or not, but what we do is we put a, put a bouncer to the door to say, hey, look, if you want to enter this type of club, you should rather answer a couple of uh, music questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you do that? Oh, okay. You've uh, stated that by 2026, you're hopeful that uh, the Guido will have uh, seven to eight million, uh, million customers and at least one million new customers each year. What makes you so hopeful about the future? Does this sound like big numbers? The first part of your uh, hypothesis was right. The second one was not right. So one million every year, this is not what we said because that would just assume a linear growth which we don't believe in. We, we believe that at the, at the long tail, we will grow yeah. faster because yeah, we, more digitization. We just no, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. But just now to clarify, because everyone otherwise expects this year one million clients and then is surprised that it's not a million. Yeah, this okay. Okay. It. Um, it is, it is, look, in the end, I think you have to have a vision. It's, it's not a guidance. We didn't say, hey, look, this is the numbers that we will meet in 2026. But when I come into the office, or you, you start with the question when I wake up, yeah. hmm. what do I think of? I think about these things like a vision, you know, where, where, we, where do we want to he head to? Mm. Where do we want to bring this whole franchise to, you know? And um, I think to, to also the, to motivate the people and your teams and to be an attractive employer for new people, you have to give people, I always say, something like a, like a light tower, mm. right? You cannot just live day by day or week by week. This is how we live operationally, mm. right? But, but you need this, this higher, higher goal. What is that? What is that vision for the EU? As I said, to utilize capital markets, capital market access, and to end up with these hopefully seven to eight million clients in five years' time. Yeah. Um, which would, by the way, result in a market share of 20 to 25%. Yeah. Um, and if I, look, if I remind you of the fact that in the Netherlands, we have a market share of 30% plus, mm. in Austria, 50% plus. In Germany, of 15 percent, you will take. In Spain, we just grew um, to, to one of the largest players. Spain became now a number three country in our portfolio. We see a lot of traction, but it's not a business which brings us back to the sustainability mm. factor. Brokerage is not a business that you build up in quarters. Okay. It took us look when we started the hero in 2011 on the retail side. It's 11 years ago. No one was waiting for another broker. You had Bing, you had IBM, you had Rabo, you had ING, you had so many players. No one was waiting for the hero to come. But we came in and it took us a decade to become market leader. Yeah. In Austria, exactly the same. When we started in 2012, no one was waiting for Flatex in Austria. Mm. Ten years later, we are market leader. In Germany, 2006, when same we started, story. same story. It took us now 12 years to become number three behind Comdirect and Consors, which is almost impossible to get by, because they are so big. So what I'm saying is, this is literally the vision mm. to manage in each and every country to become or to have a market leading yeah. or even a market leader. So nation uh, by nation. Approach. Nation by nation, country by country. We managed to do it in, in the Netherlands, in Austria, in Germany, now in Spain. 
And the focus is very strongly now on France, Italy, uh, Portugal, and then UK, Ireland. Yeah. So then in 2026, when you sit again here on the couch, <laughs> telling about how it all happened, you are managing a company which will then take in about 1.4 billion a year. Um, not bad for a for <laughs> student uh, from uh, Gutenberg. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. No, I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a long way to go, uh, four or five years, but we truly believe that we have the right team, we have the right approach, we are in the right market, we are well positioned, we have a great brand. I love the Defiro brand. Um, I sometimes have to remind myself, like, also still being half orange. Mm. Uh, not, I mean, half orange meaning flat eggs, right? Because oh, orange oh, and orange. Uh, you were very well. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but but it's 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 a very ambitious target. But I believe that we have all ingredients as to reach these targets. We wish you uh, all the best of luck with that. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for joining us. Today. Thanks for having me. We would love to thank you all for being here. Uh, would uh, invite you to come join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. as we have the uh, managing director of Europol, Catherine de Bolder, on our stage. Thank you so much and see you then. Thank you.